Now we can uh, welcome the next speaker. So whatever is to <laughs> so for the pronunciation, I ask you because I'm not sure. Uh, from the School of Business in the uh, University of Southampton. So you will talk about uh, standardized facts of prediction markets. And uh, well, this is uh, so. This is the last uh, round. We have three speakers. Then we will have a quick conclusion about this day. And well, I, I just so it will take some one minute just to mention for the program. You you, you have the program in the folder. You see that you have seen that. Uh, we have a quite busy day. Uh, after we, we will have at 5.30, we will have a two-week lecture given by Professor Rosario Montella. Um, I've been told that this room is supposed to welcome 50 people. This is what people told me. So I don't know if it, they were talking about dwarf and kids, but uh, it looks like it's impossible to have, uh, to have uh, this number of people. So I will be, I'm a bit worried about that because I think that other people, students and colleagues might come, so I will try to arrange something like, you know, teenager room or something like that, anyway. But uh, for the for the public lecture, because that will be here, so I ask the bigger room, but uh, anyway. Yeah. As a non-UK citizen, <laughs> I was informed by Peter <coughs> what's going on in politics here, and uh, just concerning the size of the room, right. do you know that the House of Commons here, they don't have enough seats for mm -hmm. all the MPs? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're in the same situation. So we might be in the same situation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it is UK, you see, as a okay. foreigner. I'm, I'm surprised. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I mean, uh, okay. So it's, uh, we, are, we will be in the same situation. Because the room is always full. Yes. <laughs> or not the bargain, but you see nobody. Indeed. But it's good, it's good to mention that. So it looks like it's a... Uh, yeah. Situation. Yes, it's a situation. We don't have to be surprised by that. Anyway, we will try to, to manage it. Uh, so that's the point. And then after that, we will have uh, the book launch uh, of the book uh, that will be in, in the room just, uh, I mean, very close to here. It's like two minutes, like just in one of these rooms over there. So in there, you will have uh, uh, beers, wine. And I realized that I forgot to ask uh, not uh, alcohol drinks. So I will have to ask quickly uh, water, orange juice for people who do not drink. So, uh, but that will be for after. We will have also some snacks there. So, okay, so enough uh, words. Now we can continue with uh, the speakers. So, Valerio, so 20 minutes for you. Great. So, uh, thank you. So, today I will, uh, I will talk about prediction markets and their status facts. So, a little bit of uh, common physics on that. But I won't talk as much about the results uh, as I will talk about the motivations because well the results you will see are quite similar as the ones you find in finance but I so I would like to talk a bit about prediction markets so is anybody familiar with prediction markets yeah I think so it's probably better to talk about that um, so prediction markets are tools that are used to make accurate uh, forecasts about events and uh, they they're, they're built on the on the um, on the idea that if you have many people with different beliefs and different information, you can aggregate that to to have um, an accurate view about something. So this is the structure of the prediction market. This is actually from uh, predictive.org, which is the website from which we got all the data. And uh, so as you can see, it's quite easy to participate in the prediction market. So well, in this case, actually, first you have to be a U.S. citizen, so it might be not that easy. But uh, apart from that, you just have one price for um, from one event. So in this case, is uh, with the U.K. trigger Article 50 by March 31st. So, and this is just a contract. So the price is 77 cents, and you can buy yes. So uh, this contract will give you, which means that this contract will give you one dollar. If this uh, if this outcome occurs and uh, zero otherwise, or well, you can buy now, so you will get one dollar if this outcome doesn't occur and uh, one dollar otherwise. So in this case, you have a price between zero and uh, one dollar. So the the current price reflects exactly the probability of that event to happen if prediction markets are good. But we we'll talk about that as well. So these are some examples of prediction markets. So they're used on uh, many different uh, situations. So you have uh, 
economics and uh, so like this kind of market will, uh, like which city will have the highest median single family home price. This can be used for uh, policy making, for example, or uh, politics, finance, or uh, uh, sales. So like the, the last one is particularly interesting because it's uh, a prediction market by Intel. So they use their employees to make forecasts about sales in uh, in a given uh, at a given time. So and there are many companies doing that right now. So the, the big ones like. Um, Google, Intel, again, uh, IBM, General Electrics, and uh, and so on, use these kind of markets to make forecasts about business. So, again, the idea about behind prediction markets is that if uh, talking again about the efficient market hypothesis, uh, is that well, if this is true, you will have accurate forecast because all the information will be immediately incorporated. So. Say even with elections, if something bad happened or there is a scandal about one of the uh, politicians involved, uh, the price should reflect immediately the, the new chances of that politician to win the elections, right? And uh, well, so <laughs> these are from uh, some important newspapers and, uh, and and blogs, and you can see that predictions are not always exactly. Uh, reflecting the, the, the real outcomes or the real probability of something happening. So uh, here we have the Financial Times saying that 84% of the people uh, in prediction markets say that, uh, sorry, 84% was the probability that prediction markets gave to um, the Remain uh, in Brexit or 85% to Clinton to win. We have even some cases like 99% and so on. And the problem here so is that, so this title is actually um, <coughs> points at the big problem in prediction markets. So prediction markets were seen as something that just give another uh, another opinion about a specific outcome. So about a specific event. So but recently they started people started to believe a lot in prediction markets. And they started to use prediction markets even to trade in financial markets. And uh, well then what happens? Well this has happened so uh, people started to think that maybe prediction markets are not as reliable as they thought. So, but this is a serious problem because we have that these situations actually generate surprise, which in, uh, in turn generates panic. And on financial markets, this is a problem. So here we see the um, the, the, the big fall of the, of the pound against the, the U.S. dollar after Brexit. So. And so this is actually just some rumors I heard from people walking uh, in London in hedge funds, and they say that many people were actually betting on the on, on the pound to rise after Brexit because they were convinced by also prediction markets and other sources, of course, that this would be the case because they were like very convinced about that and they lost a lot of money. And uh, well, I'm laughing about that. It's not to laugh about that, but I didn't invest anything. So. And uh, so. This is one of the reasons why studying prediction markets properly and uh, <coughs> accounting for all the possible problems that might skew the predictions actually is very important. Another reason is that prediction markets are well very similar to financial markets and are simpler to study. So many models that would be too uh, on financial markets would be too complex and uh, that would lead to all the overfitting and uh, and so on. Like on prediction markets might just work fine and might help to identify some issues and some reasons why prices move uh, the way they move. So some of the problems of prediction markets are, well, the heterogeneity of participants. So in the case again of Brexit, uh, you, well, I, I think that most of the people participating in prediction markets in the end were, I don't know, maybe from London, maybe with a certain uh, educational background, and uh, well, these demographics actually, in the end, uh, to show that they voted for the Remain, so they were convinced that that would happen. So of course, their uh, position on the market would be on that side. So they, they would think that they would make money out of that, and that is, is a big bias for uh, for the final prediction. Or again, if we think about the um, the internal markets that big companies use, well, they just use their employees. I mean, so that's. With a bigger bias, and another thing is low volume. So, 
low volumes have uh, actually carry a couple of problems at least. So one of them is the possibility to tweak prices. So price manipulation actually there was some evidence by a paper from a few years ago. Uh, and they found evidence that in 2012, in the US election uh, prediction markets, they actually manipulated the, um, the price for uh, Kerry, I think. Was that 2012? Anyway. And uh, to, um, well, to, 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 make, to make it appearing like, to make uh, his uh, candidacy appearing like more reasonable, <coughs> even though he didn't have any chance. But they wanted to um, to try to, to move that in their favor so they could just like keep going on and like, trying to, to, to turn the tables. And another big problem are cognitive biases, of course. I've studied that for uh, um, sports betting markets, and in sports betting markets, uh, cognitive biases skew the prices a lot. So uh, the most known anomaly in, uh, in sports betting markets, at least, is the favorable shot bias. So I will talk about that a bit later. But uh, and there are others as well, and uh, those things combined can ruin actually the prediction and the accuracy of uh, prediction markets. So, ideally, what, what I think it should be done is that uh, we, we should start using uh, complex simulations, so complexity science, so econophysics, edge-based modeling, uh, networks, and so on, to improve the knowledge we have on prediction markets, and especially to try to improve the, their forecast because the um, prediction markets are becoming more important for many reasons and uh, the, the, the former models are not working. <coughs> so one possible way, for example, is um, that we started to work on recently is to have agent-based models. So in, in this case, you can try different situations and you can try it with different uh, demographics, with different biases and see what happens to the prices. And uh, in this way also you can generate a price, a price curve depending on, uh, um, say, uh, the true probability of an event. And in that way, you can have some kind of uh, relationship between the price at some point in time and the true probability of that event. So if you model decently the agents, you might have a bad forecast about, you might at least like know the direction in which the, the price um, is biased. So, but to do that, actually, when we started to do that, we realized that we didn't have any means of, any means of validation. So, we prefer to start by um, using a quantum physics approach and to start to, um, to, to build like this list of uh, status facts of prediction markets. So this is as important as having predictive models because in the end, this is how we understand and we, buy the, uh, we understand the market and we validate the model. So now I'm talking about the, some, of, some of the results that we got so far. So we analyzed um, more than 3,000 prediction markets on politics. So from that website, predicted the world. And uh, this is actually an important thing to say because uh, it's not that in the past years people weren't working on prediction markets or weren't doing like good models on prediction markets because they were done or anything, but because we didn't have enough data. And uh, but nowadays uh, we have sources like this one. So these are um, prediction market built by a university. Uh, University of uh, Wellington, I think, New Zealand, and uh, they give data for free to academics. So uh, this is very important because you can have like many sources and uh, you have many markets to try to uh, analyze and like find similarities between them. So the, the the main point of the results is that we actually found many more similarities with financial markets that we originally thought, but we also found some important differences that we will analyze better like when, uh, with, uh, with, other, uh, with other models. So first, uh, the first thing is that for prediction markets, we can't really use log returns or percentage returns. So usually why people use percentage returns? Well, like one of the most reasons is that they're comparable across different assets. And uh, you use log returns because, uh, well, percentage returns do not aggregate in time, that's a problem. And uh, also the distribution of, uh, of percentage uh, is not symmetric, so you can have, of course, like uh, just minus one, but plus infinity. And uh, well, there are also other reasons, but with uh, uh, also the approximation with log returns and, uh, and percentage returns works in uh, 
quite small area actually around uh, around zero. So we see from that that uh, for um, percentage returns between uh, minus 10 percent and minus uh, plus 10 percent, the difference is actually between uh, uh, plus minus five percent with the log returns. But as soon as we move out from uh, from that area, actually the difference becomes larger. And this is a problem for prediction markets because the percentage returns have this distribution. So you see most of the returns are way bigger than 0.1 or minus 0.1. Because, and why is this by, well, you have prices that are bounded between 0 and 1. So a very common price, for example, is uh, 0 0.01, which means that if the, if, the, if the price moves just by one tick, you either have an upward movement of 100%, Downward movement of 100%. Sorry, of uh, of 100%. Yeah, and, uh, or a downward movement of uh, 100%, which you can also see the spikes around that. So the, you you can't really analyze the market for this uh, with, with this return. So raw uh, raw returns in this case actually uh, present better properties. So they are bounded by minus one and one. Uh, they do aggregating time, and the price is always uh, between zero and one for. Uh, Every asset, so they are comparable. They're uh, better to, they're like easier to to use, and they have some nice properties that are basically the same properties that people wanted in uh, in finance with log returns. So as you can see, like the, the, um, the distribution of prices now is much smoother, and uh, you can of course immediately observe that it's not a Gaussian. So. The first thing we do is that is to check the tails, and uh, we find uh, already one interesting thing. So, this is the number of returns we have, and uh, we find well the mean is zero, the cryptosis is positive, but also the skewness is positive. So, this means that opposite the financial markets, we actually have more negative returns, but uh, we also find that positive returns are larger usually on average. And uh, we don't know yet whether this is due to the structure of the market, so maybe like having a payoff, or this is for uh, some other reason, and this is why actually one of the reasons why we're building an agent-based model for that. So um, uh, to to fit the power tail, uh, the power law on the heavy tails, we have to use a slightly different uh, approach because of course we have discrete data, so it's not like in finance in which you well you you have almost real numbers. In this case, we just have uh, <coughs> a given number of possible returns, and uh, a normal estimation wouldn't work. So we use the Horowitz Z approach from uh, Barker, and uh, you have um, uh, alpha is possible to compute uh, numerically by using a maximum likelihood estimate estimator. So we've done this. And uh, we decided uh, by following the Closet paper, Newman paper, we moved the, the, the minimum max at which, so the minimum return at which to, to start considering the, the distribution of returns are power, uh, power low. And we found that actually most of it <coughs> follows a power low, so most of the tails are starting by 9 in positive returns and 14 in negative returns. So as you can see, as I was saying, that we have more observations for negative returns, but also a um, uh, lower exponent for positive ones. So these are the probability distributions, uh, um, probability densities for uh, both the both the tails, and you can see that after the x min actually follows uh, pretty much uh, a straight line. Of course, you have. Uh, mm, you, you, you have the, um, the density increasing a bit, and I believe is that because you can't go more than one. So um, th there is no way to actually like push forward. That. So another thing we find is that the autocorrelation of um, of returns is pretty much non-existent. So we have, of course, uh, lag one. We have a negative correlation, which is probably what uh, it, it was saying uh, previously. That so that. Um, because of the low volumes we have that in many days, especially at the beginning of big markets, so it might last like three years, and at the beginning we don't have, we don't have transactions, <laughs> or we just have few transactions and the price just remains the same, so the return is zero and this generates these. 
But also, uh, yeah, sorry, the lag all day is uh, we are only talking about uh, daily returns. <coughs> and uh, we, we see there is also volatility clustering. And uh, we more or less like same, uh, same level, same slope as in finance. So this one actually uh, just is, uh, um, goes down slightly faster than in finance, but I mean, uh, it's quite close anyway. And uh, this is another important part because these actually so so we see that um, most of the things are the same as in finance. So, which is I think good news. But also there are other things that in finance don't exist, like the fair market bias. So this is a presentation from a previous paper we've done. And uh, so on the on, on the x-axis we have the true probabilities of an event, and uh, we have the corresponding prices on the y. So as you can see, like the, the favorites, so those uh, those outcomes with a high probability to happen are actually underpriced systematically. And uh, on the other side, you have outcomes with a low probability to happen, that, which are overpriced. So this was quite significant actually, but and, uh, and it was in football. But that happens like pretty much in all sports betting, and it was observed many times in prediction markets as well. But that was in the past because Recently, we found these, and also we found these. So we, we found that in these prediction markets we analyzed, there is actually a reverse favorable bias, which means that these would be the other way around. So favorites are actually overpriced, and, and this is similar to what we saw from Brexit or the U.S. election. So that the favorites, which were clearly the Remain and Clinton, uh, were overestimated. So that their chances were overestimated to win. And uh, so already from, uh, from, this is the time dynamic for, uh, for the favorable long-shot bias, and, uh, <coughs> which is uh, computed with a very simple metric just to, to give a hint of uh, what it looks like. So uh, basically it's the difference between the price and uh, <coughs> the corresponding probability. And uh, by, start, by looking at this dynamic already, I mean, we can already see that there is a simple okay. and neat way to correct the probability. So, we have an actual number and we have an actual uh, profile of that and we could just simply correct the, um, the, the extremes especially of the, of the prices to adapt them to, to the real probabilities to at least like <coughs> making them closer to the real probabilities. So the conclusions are that we, we just started to, to work on that and there are not many studies about that uh, at least with, uh, from this point of view. And uh, we really think, I really think, that we should try to um, to adapt like all these things that also we're <coughs> seeing today to prediction markets. And uh, and this is possibly like the the only way to make reasonable forecasts with these tools. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. The time now for questions, comments. Yes, Peter. Yeah, it's kind of interesting looking at those things, I think. We, we want to publish some work on betting markets, yep. soccer games, that kind of thing, the outcome. But what interests me in, in that is, and you go back to the Brexit business, mm -hmm. where the polls were approaching, what was it, 48, 52, yep. but in That's favor true. of Remain. And I just wonder whether we're kind of being fooled by the um, the uncertainty which exists in our knowledge of that. And you, you're looking, a focus group is basically a small group of people, isn't it? So you don't really have a representative sample of, of what you're looking at. You have one kind of small community or giving you a plumbing. And it's probably actually closer to a coin toss rather than what the prediction markets say at the end of the day, because no one really, if you look at every one of the law, it's probably, there's so much volatility, if you like, in, mm -hmm. in, in the thing. But and and you don't have a Brownian kind of motion, you've got Brownian motion with a, a, a fluctuating volatility as well, just mm -hmm. like stock prices. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So if you, if you have a look at that, actually here, I'm sorry, but you can't see the 
the, the price very well. So here we approach 80% actually, mm. and this was the biggest price was on uh, yeah. Betfair. And uh, I, I agree that, that there is a lot of volatility and there is a lot of uh, uncertainty and people don't know what they're really doing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. if you think also about the fact that this was the result of uh, a market which was uh, which were, uh, in which the, the participants were the very same people who actually voted. So of course, like just uh, um, a small group of them, so it wasn't representative at all. But still, we had uh, I think like uh, I don't know like demographics actually you could see an eight percent for remain, right? Mm. So there is also an additional bias in that because uh, let's say I don't know uh, with the prediction market here in this room, and uh, I don't know. If I, my idea is that if I want to vote for Brexit, I would probably bet my money on Brexit. Or at least I would try to see what everybody else is thinking, right? Uh, and still, like, uh, you, there was no sort of strong, like, um, say, favor in that, in, in that, even among, like, uh, small demographics. And still, like, you have that on, uh, on the market. I mean, you wouldn't get a bunch of New York Times journalists as your focus group, would you, if you were trying to analyze that program? Yep. Because it would be 100% Hillary Clinton. Um, so, well, these results actually, I, I don't know uh, what they were from, uh, but it's probably, well, actually, that one's from Predicted, so um, it was uh, from the US, and uh, another one I read was the, from the famous Iowa market. So. Mm. And, uh, but again, this was from uh, from Betfair, which is in England, and sure. it was accessible yeah. from England. Yeah. <coughs> we use Betfair for the data we have yeah. as well. Yeah. Which is better because it's such a like, uh, higher liquidity. But, uh, yeah, the good part about Relief is that we have many markets and they're for free. Another question? Yep. I was just wondering the the pictures that you showed. They are like average over all these markets. Like if you if you if you show autocorrelation function, that's like taking these prices for each of these um, each of these sessions and then averaging them over, or is yeah. that like one represent? Yeah, yeah, that's average yeah, yeah. Over everything. everything is done in that way. So except from the returns, uh, because well, it doesn't really matter. But uh, all, all the other things are done in, uh, in that way. So basically, we've done like all the all the experiments. Um, Market by market by market, and then just the yeah, average all together. Except from the favorable short bias one, in which we actually wanted to see uh, the differences depending on the length of the market, mm. because that might vary. And indeed, like the, it, it was slightly different. I'm also wondering how this really co because in first few slides you had this parallel or, or connection to the efficient markets, and I'm just I'm just wondering how this holds in a way because th there is no secondary market for these or is there you either buy yes or no but, but you cannot sell it you, you just wait you can sell it you can sell it yeah you can sell it oh okay yeah it's totally tradable so okay. it's like uh, in this case like uh, no where, where was it yeah yeah so it's a state contingent claim contract so you can buy sell and you have to pay off in the end at a given time okay so it's up to you, like whether to keep it or uh, sell it or trade it. So it's like a tradable option, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. Thanks. Another question? Yeah. Uh, you said that you analyzed the order three thousand uh, yep. different uh, markets. Uh, do you have a? I mean, I guess you don't have too much uh, demographic information. At least the, the number of, of different investors that have entered the market. We unfortunately don't have anything <laughs> about that. So I'm uh, now we're collecting, for example, always the um, order level data. So we have all the transactions and uh, all the modifications and cancellations and executions and stuff. And we don't have any corresponding ID. Mm -hmm. So we don't even know. <coughs> Who's placing the, the trades and uh, when? Or we just have the orders. So for these, uh, for for these like preliminary. Could be also just two people. Ah yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just given the volumes. <laughs> no, actually, on, uh, on on more important markets, the the volumes are quite high, and especially on the, on that field, we're talking about like millions. It's not, of course, as much as the financial yes, market, yes. but still. Pretty decent to have a good liquidity. Oh, at some time, also in the financial market, at the mini, I mean, when they did the study concerning uh, the 
flash crash. In the end, there were 15,000 accounts. So mm -hmm. Sometimes the numbers are not so huge. But I think it is important to know I mean, how many different people are investing. In yeah, that was my dream indeed, because I mean, like for building an agent model, of course, that, uh, that information would be priced at. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I mean, that's for finance right now, but I mean, yeah, it makes the whole difference. Yeah, well, another question? One well, additional, yeah. Because yeah, I thought there is no secondary market. So 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 actually if there is a secondary market, you might be really interested in if you if you can make money on that, right? Because you don't really care if in the end you were able to predict it correctly or if the market predicted ah, it that, correctly. That's, yeah. But you just care about whether you find autocorrelation, hence you can build the model and you can you can make profit on that, which would go against the efficiency. But but that's that's what you you are more interested in, right? Like actually building um, some kind of a trading strategy that would benefit on these. Like these I stars. personally, like, like in, in, yeah, yeah, sure. Why not? Uh, because, because the volumes are pretty much ridiculous right now, so I mean, like you can't make much money. But um, no, I, I mean, I, I don't know. That's of course like it, it's interesting, but um, I'm not sure that just by having a look at that you can make a good strategy because. Uh, the, the price impact is too big. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in most of markets, probably not in, well, also in, uh, on that fair, but especially in these ones, uh, it's just insane how much you can uh, can just like manipulate the markets with just one big order. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I mean, like, that, but the point is that uh, I personally don't uh, don't care much about like, predicting who's uh, going to win the U.S. elections. But I mean, that also has other implications, right? Because, as I said, of course, like you have the, the most data about politics and sports and uh, and other things, because these are the things that actually attract people. Because everybody wants to bet against Trump, right? And uh, but um, I mean, you have way more prediction markets beyond that, and uh, on anything really, like you, you can get anything. So, it can be a very powerful tool. And uh, well, now for some reason actually become worse than it was in the past. So I mean, that, that, that's already interesting to me, at least. Yes. Could you back to this, this slide to uh, present the Brexit with this mm -hmm. jump? Or, uh, no, another one. This red thread. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh yeah. Did you consider the statistics uh, as a naive question before and after this, this jump, statistical this quotation, or let's say increments of this before and after, uh, statistical increments of this, this rate? Uh, because it looks like the, the statistic uh, distribution strongly, strongly changed. So it looks like a, First order phase transition or dynamic first order phase transition or perhaps kind of quenched quench effect in physical language. So, but, but the point is that what would be the statistics for this one? Because perhaps there is some indication inside, uh, or you see before, before this jump there is volatility increase. But wait, is the. Um, the then you could the, the first exchange. This, this, the, yeah, the first yeah. exchange, you could, you could look for statistics and see uh, this on right, the statistic which is could ex excess kurtosis is definitely much larger. And the <coughs> question is maybe there's some kind of universality in this. Oh, no, no. Yeah. In, this in this sense. But could you predict this? this mm -hmm. A kind of accident or dragon king? Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> so you're basically asking me if I if, if I can predict a market crash? Well, wouldn't be here probably. But <laughs> uh, no, I can't predict any market crash, and I don't even know how to do that. Because it looks like random walk. Random walk. From time to time, if you look, for example, let's say. Weierstrass uh, random walk or Weierstrass Mandelbrot random walk. It looks definitely like this one. So from time to time, but very rarely, depends on parameters, you have a strong jump. And then again, there's some, so that's the reason. It's this, 
how to say it, are you able to describe this by one statistics or you need uh, uh, completely different statistics, I mean two different words? Uh, well, I, I don't know, I never had a look at that actually. Uh, and you speak about predictions in, in statistical sense or deterministic sense? Uh, well, in a statistical sense, of course. Like, sense. You, you can't have like a uh, exact out. Uh, it's just like to, to, to have uh, a better forecast of what might happen okay. about many things. Like what happened with probability or... Uh, yeah, yeah, like in a probabilistic way, of course. All right. Okay, or the, uh, last question, quick one maybe, or is everything okay for everybody? All right, then thank you very much again for your presentation.